everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host, Kushal Mehra. All right. So, Imran Khan is no longer the Prime Minister of Pakistan. So, a few weeks ago, I had Mohammad Taki on the podcast where we were discussing the Pakistani perspective. Now that Imran Khan is gone and you have a new government in Pakistan to discuss what's happening in Pakistan, we have our expert Pakistani, Afghanistan and Punjabi analyst, Sushant Sarish. Sushant, welcome. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for having me. So, Sushan, let's start like this. Uh, let me ask you this question first. And uh, you may do like essay question, pushta, but still, do you think from our perspective, uh, for, uh, actually, maybe I'll start. Are you having withdrawal symptoms now that Imran Khan is gone? <laughs> Look, uh, Kushal, I, I'm talking about 2015, probably, right? There was a very senior retired uh, Pakistan army officer who was in town and he had come to my house for dinner. In the course of the conversation, late night, uh, some the conversation turned to Imran Khan. And, um, you know, I told him, I said, uh, sir, I think uh, Imran Khan is the best thing that will happen to India and Pakistan. So this guy, you know, he peered through his glasses and he had this smirk on his face. And he said, you are quite a rascal. Uh, but uh, why do you say this? So I gave him a, you know, bit of a rundown on what my analysis of Imran Khan was. And, uh, you know, to be fair to the guy, he... Uh, he said, you know, there is within the military establishment, there is a sense that, look, uh, we have left with no other choice but to go with this guy. And they have placed a lot of faith in him. Uh, but then he admitted, he says, I suspect you might be right. So when he became prime minister, uh, you know, Within the first week, 10 days, the kind of decisions he started taking, you know, his economic model was, uh, we'll sell off the buffaloes, we'll sell off the cars, we'll sell off this, we'll sell off that, you know, that kind of stuff. And it was very clear that this guy is completely clueless. He has no idea about anything. And what I had noticed was that, you know, even when he was, if you opened the papers in the morning uh, and you heard Imran Khan in the evening, Whatever was the headlines of the morning was what he parroted in the evening. And even during the course of his, uh, his, his uh, you know, speeches, uh, whatever somebody used to whisper in his one ear, he would, you know, vomit it out uh, in, in that public meeting. So he is a man of uh, somewhat limited intellect, uh, intellectual ability, uh, which I'm not surprised given that he's from Oxford University. And I haven't really seen many intelligent people come out of either Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, uh, but frankly, uh, uh, if I was, uh, you know, uh, the, the president of Oxford University or whatever they call that person, uh, I would ban anybody from, uh, you know, counting Imran Khan as an alumni because he's the worst possible advertisement for that university. But uh, from an Indian point of view, he was fabulous because uh, both in government and now that he's in opposition, he has done stuff which, uh, you know, uh, we could only dream of doing in Pakistan. He has single-handedly, uh, you know, uh, ruined the Pakistan economy, completely demolished it. Uh, he has, uh, he has uh, spoiled Pakistan's uh, foreign relations with many countries uh, on which Pakistan survived. Uh, within the Pakistani polity, he has uh, sown the kind of polarization which has never been seen before. He has damaged the Pakistan army like no other political leader in Pakistan has done. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, his, his basically his Islamism, his rhetoric, all of that uh, is, uh, is a dream come true for any Indian. Supposing the RAW had sent a spy uh, to become Prime Minister of Pakistan. Even that guy would not have done what Imran Khan has managed to do. So, yes. Uh, short answer to your uh, question, uh, although I've given a very long answer. Uh, 
uh, is that yes, uh, there are serious withdrawal symptoms, but my faith in Imran Khan stands because even in opposition, he is doing things uh, which uh, one can only dream of, uh, you know, someone doing in Pakistan. So, so my faith in him still stands very much. Uh, so, so maybe let's let's go down this route of Imran Khan, the opposition leader right now. So, what do you think he's doing right now? I mean, in terms of cluelessness or maybe just policy recommendations that he gives? Look, number one, uh, you know, he has a serious personality disorder. It's very clearly. He's a megalomaniac. He's a narcissist. Uh, he's a spoiled child, uh, you know, who feels that, uh, who, who has a very high sense of entitlement. Uh, and all of that has come into play now. The way he tried to stick on to power uh, was a scandal in itself. The way he uh, tried to play a fiddle with the constitution is, is again in front of everybody. The way he has started targeting the army, uh, you know, literally calling the serving army chief Amir Jafar and Amir Sadiq. Uh, his troll armies, the way they abuse the, uh, the army chief and the army, uh, is unparalleled in Pakistani history, right? And the way they have put pressure on the Pakistan army, which has been shown to be toothless tigers. They, you know, in the past, it was believed that the moment you spoke out against the army and in Pakistan, you know, if you are watching a news channel, uh, they censor it. The moment you start talking about the Pakistan army, you will suddenly see a blank space or, you know, the audio going blank for about 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and then it comes back on after the reference to the Pakistan army is over. In a country like that, where a, a whole lot of self-censorship operated, where people referred to the army very obliquely, never directly, right? Uh, they, they were given all sorts of, uh, you know, there were all sorts of euphemisms used for the Pakistan army. In that country, uh, when Imran Khan is very clearly alluding to the Pakistan army, as being part of an international conspiracy against him. I think that's a wonderful thing for us to happen. Right. Uh, and he is, and he has manufactured this conspiracy theory out of thin air, literally out of thin air. Right. Uh, which is again, excellent because, uh, you know, uh, and, and to that extent, you have to give him the credit that he has been able to build a narrative around it. Uh, but it's a fake narrative. Uh, which has taken ground. Now, the public in Pakistan is also that stupid that it is buying it. Uh, but it's good because uh, the way he has polarized, you know, he has divided the army from within. Uh, he has played politics within the army, which was really a no-go area for anybody. Uh, he has openly lambasted the army. He has challenged the generals that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have support from within your families. He has divided their families. Now, clearly, uh, that's not such a bad thing as far as we are concerned. Right? Uh, so, it's from that point of view. Secondly, his, uh, uh, you know, uh, his toxic politics aside, uh, he has now turned out to, uh, and he's proven to be a thief. His one, he was a one-trick pony. Uh, he only spoke about accountability, corruption, pretended that he was completely above board, completely financially clean, which is utter nonsense. Just yesterday, they have released a clip where, uh, you know, he gave this, uh, uh, I think he's the richest man in Pakistan probably, or at least the most influential businessman, a, a real estate tycoon by the name of Malik Riaz. And apparently, Malik Riaz was fined uh, something like 190 million pounds in the UK. Wow. And, and he was ordered to return that money to Pakistan. That money was returned to Pakistan. Earlier, a, a Pakistani uh, court, had the Supreme Court, had ordered Malik Riaz because he had done some shady land deals. They had ordered him to pay something like 500 billion rupees, which is what uh, 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 1 billion is 100 crores. So about, do the math here, I, I forgot, 50,000 crores or something, right? 
they had ordered him to pay that kind of money over the next maybe 10 12 in 10 or 12 installments or something like that now when this money which was transferred from england to pakistan uh, which is clearly an illegal uh, you know money uh, money laundering which malik riaz had done ideally it should have gone into the pakistani treasury it didn't go into the treasury it went into malik uh, riaz's accounts from which he paid one of the installments of the fine which the supreme court of pakistan had levied on him <laughs> right so this was a clear favor and you know in return for what a ring a diamond ring worth 5 carats or 5 carats wait when what he, yeah, that's that that's the clip which is playing, which has gone viral in Pakistan. So he is such a ghatia fellow. He is the kind of a guy that the Saudi crown prince gave him a watch, right? So he took that watch <laughs> on a bargain basement price from what is called the Tosha Khana, okay? And then he's such a ghatia fellow, yeah. He went and sold it in the market and profited from it. Can you believe this? There are others who have taken those watches and kept it as a family heirloom. This guy went and sold it in the market and profited from it. He's, the level of ghatiyapan in the fellow is, is astounding. So now that scandal has come out. And uh, most of all, uh, you know, uh, he is trying to rebuild his political image by latching on to uh, some... Uh, economic measures, very tough economic measures, which the new government is taking. But they are trying to fix the uh, the mess ups he made in the Pakistan economy. But uh, that is going to inflict a lot of pain. But he is now trying to capitalize on it. So every which way you look at it, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, he is damaging Pakistan the way nobody else could have done. Uh, he is a godsend in many ways. Yeah, so in a very interesting way, if you look at it from an Indian perspective, Imran Khan has actually pushed the Overton window in the Pakistani discourse by doing this thing with the armed forces being questioned and being inside, like Bajwa is being incessantly trolled on social media. Like I saw some really hilarious memes of Bajwa on Twitter where, you know, Pakistanis are sharing memes and making TikTok videos of Bajwa and all that stuff. So in that sense, you know, uh, not that I'm making it as a positive thing, but it is a positive thing, right? If, if Pakistani society comes to a point where they can even mock the army in that sense? No. Uh, see, you have to understand where uh, much of his support base comes from. But let me say, uh, uh, le let me talk about how it is positive. Uh, and I now I don't mean it in a cynical way. I think what Imran Khan has managed to do is three things. One, he has proven that no matter which puppet you get, the moment somebody becomes a prime minister, right, he wants to exercise power and he is not going to remain your puppet. A lesson which the Pakistan army should have learned in the past and stopped meddling, but it hasn't learned. But nevertheless, that message has gone across very well this time. The second thing which Imran Khan has done is that he has shown that despite the fact that the army... Uh, you know, uh, manipulates politics from behind the scenes. It ensures that nobody gets a majority in parliament. And then the coalition is made with the support of uh, members of, uh, you know, or, or political parties which are in the army's pocket. So regime change becomes very easy because all that they need to do is pull out support. Mm -hmm. But what Imran Khan has proven is that even a, a, a shaky coalition uh, it is not easy to dislodge it. So regime change of the kind which the army uh, used to do, manipulate, is not uh, a very easy thing to do. And number three, uh, he has, uh, although I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, give all the credit to him, I, I think the floodgates for this was opened by Nawaz Sharif. But what Imran Khan has done is that... Uh, Nawaz Sharif named and shamed some generals a couple of years back. What Imran Khan has done is taken it to the next level. So the army, as you very correctly pointed out, is now fair game, right? It's an open season. It's, it's being targeted. People are raising questions. Why should the army's budgets not be curtailed? How can the army do this? How can the army do that? 
So I think that's the third positive change that Imran Khan has brought out, which if you uh, take it uh, and if it is, you know, you push this thing through, uh, can deal a blow in favor of civilian supremacy in Pakistan. So these are the three positives to come out of what Imran Khan has done. As far as that trolling game and all of that is concerned, you have to understand that uh, his basic support base comes from uh, he has a mass support. I will not deny that, but it's not a mass support which will, which is an election winning mass support, right? Got it. Uh, but he has a mass support, number one. Number two, uh, a lot of that mass support is very vocal and voluble. These are people who are entitled. These are people who are members of the elite. Uh, these are people who've gone to the best public schools and foreign universities and Pakistani universities. Uh, these, these are well-heeled people, right? So uh, these are the privileged elite in Pakistan. Uh, for any state to crack down on them, and this, this is part of that, you know, for want of a better way, the, the Latians cabal equivalent of Pakistan. And Kabal is a small number of people, but this is like an entire ecosystem, right? Uh, you call it the 1%, the 2% crowd, if you will. It is that crowd. To, uh, to crack down on them is not easy because uh, many of them have, uh, you know, their uncles or their parents or somebody or the other who's part of the ruling hierarchy, uh, the permanent establishment either in the bureaucracy or in the army or big businessmen linked with the army, uh, you know, that kind of a crowd or top professionals, their family members, they themselves, retired uh, soldiers, ex-servicemen, all of that. So it's not easy for somebody to, uh, you know, shut these guys up. Which, like I said, if I'm not cynical, then I'll say, okay, look, that's a good thing because that means that... Uh, you know, it circumscribes the power of the army. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if Imran Khan thinks that with the support of this troll army of his, he can come back into power, I I would have very serious doubts on that. You know, it's like Musharraf, who had 7 million followers on, I think, Facebook. He came back to Karachi thinking that, you know, all of those people will come to receive him. I think there were not even 70 people at the airport. So uh, people who think that social media doubles up for, uh, you know, the rough and tumble of politics, the heat and dust of politics in South Asia, uh, I, I, I think they've already lost the plot. Yeah, and that applies to some people in India too, who keep uh, mistaking social media hoopla for uh, yeah, real politics. Yeah, clever on social media is good politics. Well, it's, it's okay, they can... They only they are only helping their political rivals and adversaries, which mm -hmm. is okay. I guess. Now let's get into the next part. Okay, Imran to chalega. I think one more thing that Imran damaged was that attempt to actually. I mean, at least in Mohammad Taki's uh, understanding, he said the one thing that bothered him the most about Imran Khan, other than destroying the Pakistani economy, was his brazen attempt to play with the constitution of Pakistan, whatever little is left with it. And he was like, that is something that is unforgivable and nobody in Pakistan uh, kind of can forgive him for that. Now, what's your take on that? Dr. Taki, you know, is a non-resident Pakistani and, uh, you know, he can root in favor of constitutional niceties in Pakistan. But which Pakistani leader has ever uh, adhered to the constitution? Pakistan constitution is, uh, okay, I don't want to use any uh, colorful phrases, <laughs> but uh, let me let me just say, uh, con you know, I, I, I'll i just quote what uh, a former military dictator Ziaul Haq once said about the constitution. It's a bunch of papers which I can tear up and throw it away at any time. Yeah, what constitution are you talking about when you have a judiciary like the kind you are? The jokers, yeah, they're not judges, they're jokers in the Pakistani judiciary, right? These are guys who have convicted a prime minister on basis of a salary 
which he had never received. Right? They've convicted him on corruption charges. This is a judiciary where it is very clearly written in the constitution that look, if in three cases you have to vote on along party lines, okay, if you don't, then you are going to be de-seated. Now, this court, a bunch of clowns, these guys pass a judgment that you will be de-seated, yes, but your vote will also not count. Effectively saying that if you are a dissenter against the party leadership, you either resign, but you cannot vote against you know, or or it, uh, you cannot give a vote on the basis of your conscience. So, a, a, a Prime Minister of Pakistan can tomorrow decide that he is going to be breaking up the country and his own party men cannot oppose him without resigning because uh, the court has passed a judgment like that. But it's bizarre. So when people talk about, you know, upholding the constitution, not violating the constitution, they're talking through their hat, really. The constitution is, is it's nothing. Yaar. As far as Pakistan is concerned, jiski lati uski mes. I remember that in 2012, a path-breaking judgment came from the Pakistani Supreme Court when they decided the right price of samosa. That was a path-breaking judgment. <laughs> You know, these are the kind of ridiculous judgments these guys have passed. I can give you chapter and verse of one can write an entire book on the bizarre kind of judgments Pakistani judges have given. So the judicial system is screwed. Now, Pakistan can make what you know what people say in Pakistan. Now, you have a judicial system like this fellow Atta Bandial, who's their chief justice, is a horribly corrupt man. Horribly corrupt. And a, a complete duffer. Again, Cambridge or something. He's Cambridge or Oxford. Right? But yeah, I don't know why anybody would send their kids to UK for education anymore. Yeah. It's like, if this is the product and this was, these are guys who studied in the 60s and 70s. Right? If this is what UK turned out then, I shudder to think what kind of people they're churning out now. Yeah. But you name the judges. Bizarre judgments coming out of that place. And it, it's a laughing stock for any person who has even a, the slightest modicum of legal knowledge. So, if you want to talk about the constitution, then I don't deal with the deal in fiction, but it's okay. <laughs> नहीं नहीं फिर ठीक है फिर रियलिटी में आते हैं चलो ठीक है अभी इमरान खान से फोकस हटाते हैं ऑलराइट right, अभी नई गवर्नमेंट आई है पाकिस्तान में शबाज शरीफ जी हैं वापस आए हैं मतलब पता नहीं उनको क्या होता है उनका माइक गिरता रहता है वो बड़ा अजीब सा था कि उनका वो वीडियो निकला था माइक गिरने वाला था बड़ा था मगर बट अगेन फ्रॉम एन इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव सुशांत ऑन अ वेरी सीरियस लेवल what do you make of this new dispensation that has come in Pakistan? Or, or the, the overall analysis is that Sanu ki jo bhi aaya, hamari wahi hone wala hai, kind of a scenario. I think the latter part is probably correct. Um, look, my own sense is that um, there's never going to be peace between India and Pakistan. It's a mugs game. It's not going to happen, right? Even if the Pakistanis and many Pakistanis say that, look, it is in our interest to settle with India. Uh, which is all very well, but then the terms of settlement have to be on the basis of what they want, right? Which is basically breakup of India. Uh, to not make too much, uh, to put a fine uh, point on it, that is what their minimum settlement is. So I, I think that's a non-workable proposition. Uh, and in any case, if they want any temporary accommodation, I don't see any reason why we should be interested in a temporary accommodation. We have made those uh, assumptions in the past and uh, we have suffered the consequences of it. Uh, so, for example, we always thought, ke, you know, if, if we start moving forward, uh, we develop stakes, uh, you know, stuff like that. We develop stakes with China. You know how that's turned out. Uh, so, we develop stakes with the Pakistanis. 
uh, and you know once we engage each other most of these contentious issue will you know just disappear on their own i don't think that's the way it's going to work out okay that's my own analysis uh, people are free to disagree with me on that we are still a free country but uh, so i don't think that's going to happen uh so i what i think will happen is that uh, in the case of people like shabash sharif or anybody else i think the kind of abusive language which imran khan used to use uh, will not happen anymore uh, mm. that does not mean pakistan is going to soften its stand is going to start using very uh, civilized language no you've seen what has happened over the last day or two uh, they will not leave any opportunity to try and you know uh, put us down to try and undercut us to try and harm us in whichever way possible all of that <clears throat> will continue the way it has always continued <clears throat> what will only change is some of the cosmetics of it uh what can also change is you know maybe some slight opening here and there in terms of uh, because and that is also because they are desperate uh you know they desperately need cotton for example because they have a thriving cotton industry cotton textile industry so they need cotton now they can either buy it from china which is most likely going to be sanctioned cotton uh, because a lot of it comes from xinjiang or they can buy it from some other place pay hefty freight charges and then not be competitive in the international market which they are not going to be also because of rising uh, power and fuel tariffs and all of that uh, rising inflation the, you know uh so i think all of that is also start going to start having an impact on them uh so for their own reasons they will need they some people are saying that we need to open up to india so some of that might happen but if anybody thinks that somebody like a shabash sharif who is who's just a slightly more uh, civilized version of imran khan uh something big will change i don't think that's going to happen please remember shabash sharif's party and nawaz sharif's party is uh, uh, is uh, the original right wing uh, hardline muslim party right uh, mm -hmm. for anybody to think that these are guys who are going to you know be amenable to uh, some kind of uh, accommodation with india I, i have serious doubts it will happen so neither the liberals by in the i use the term advisedly in the pakistani context uh neither the liberals are in a position to make peace nor the right wingers nor the army which is not interested okay they might be interested in tamping down or 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 bringing down the temperature but they are not interested in uh, uh you know making a breakthrough that's that's not there so i think you know rather than keep chasing the shimera we should we should i i think the other favor which imran khan really did to us was that with all the abuse that he heaped on india he ensured that india will never reach out to these buggers hmm right so that was not a bad thing because in india we have these withdrawal symptoms that we must start talking to pakistan after some time you know there are enough this this so called clueless element and usual suspects in the media people who suffer from stockholm syndrome for having either served in pakistan or worked in pakistan or having some friends in pakistan um, who harbor these notions that you know maybe we can do business with them i have reached the conclusion that it's, it's not going to happen it's as simple as that okay let okay let me try to play the devil's advocate in that case so what if somebody comes and you can play the devil's that... advocate just don't play the devil No, no, बिल्कुल नहीं मैं डेवल नहीं आई एम ऑन योर साइड सुशांत सो इफ यू आर द डेवल देन आई एम वन सो सो नो वॉट डू यू वॉट डू यू से टू दो पीपल हु से लुक शाहबाज शरीफ इज ही रियली द प्राइम मिनिस्टर इन दैट सेंस यू नो ऑब्वियसली हिज ब्रदर नवाज शरीफ वॉज रियली इन पावर एंड honestly even right, as of now when it comes to the control of the political party i mean their political party uh, nawaz sharif still carries a lot of control point number 2 uh, i i read a very interesting line in one of the op-eds of india today uh, written by darpan singh on 13th april 
so uh, so spare me some moment so nawaz sharif has a good equation with prime minister narendra modi so much so that pm modi while flying back home from afghanistan in 2015 made a surprise stopover in pakistan to attend nawaz sharif's family function that was the first visit to pakistan by an indian pm in over a decade so many would argue shahbaz sharif should be seen as an extension of nawaz sharif who still calls the shots in their party pmln despite being in london after having been disqualified in 2018 from contesting elections now obviously he does qualify it with the military factor ye kisne likha hai darpan singh some journalist in new delhi i don't know i don't know i i just read uh, opted i had read it a while ago <laughs> so uh, i ju- i just thought of reading it for you <laughs> so does this answer your question oh yes yaar modi likhne ko jo marzi likh lo main bhi is type ka i can write this nonsense uh, india today of course will not publish it but uh, this nonsense i i can write it very well i am i'm very good in sophistry really but this is utter crap right but it's written by somebody who doesn't know his front side from his back as far as pakistan is concerned i'm sorry to say this but it's very clear very apparent to me uh, and look you know we keep beating around the look modi is no friend of nawaz sharif right mm-hmm. i don't think you can accuse mr modi of being many things but i don't think one thing you can accuse him of is naivety he mm-hmm. was playing a diplomatic you know ek pasa feka yaar matlab he was he he threw the a diplomatic dice uh and he was seeing whether you know his thing that if uh, you develop a kind of a personal rapport can you push diplomacy forward with that he tried it with other leaders sometimes it's been successful sometimes less so for example in the case of trump it was quite successful in some other cases might not have been it was as simple as that right it is not that mr modi was suffering from some kind of a nostalgia Yeah. he has none he is not thankfully he is not a punjabi you know all that uh, nostalgia which most of the people from punjab have as they pretend as though they were some kind of local potentates every punjabi who has come from across the border i'm sure your family is also come you must be saying yeah. we had so much land we had so much property we had as though they were the rulers of the place they were not yaar 99% of them were not lage hue hain matlab ki kahaniyan banane mein unnecessarily they had a bloody good deal in india yaar anyways i don't want to get into that debate so uh, modi does not have any of those illusions right uh, i don't think he is also uh, one of those who's hankering for a nobel peace prize as some of his predecessors have been uh, so i think he threw the dice and clearly within a week he was given he was told that it doesn't work when pathan court attack had happened yeah it was one week after he went to lahore right also remember that a day before he went to lahore or perhaps that morning or maybe the night before he was in kabul and please take out the speech which he made in the parliament of the islamic republic of afghanistan on that day which i think was the 24th of december 2016 if i am not mistaken or 2015 i might be getting the year wrong uh please take out that speech read it and then say and and then uh, uh, you know look at modi visiting pakistan the next day and it hits you like a brick because he said something completely different in afghanistan he made a complete complete different gesture in uh, lahore and he came mm-hmm. back to india and one week later the pakistani stabbed him in the back hmm okay so for anybody to say ki no nawaz sharif shabash even in those days nawaz sharif was a guy who understood the benefits of having better relations or normal relations with india nawaz sharif is nobody's fool and he is no uh, you know uh, 
he is not a person who is um, you know an india lover or any such thing no got it but he realized for pakistan's own sake that it is a good thing if we normalize with india hmm. even then shabash sharif uh, you know who is a, a bit of a weirdo in many ways was not exactly on board mm hmm so i don't know this gentleman who's writing for india today i think one of the reasons why magazines have started taking such a hit is people like him uh but the fact of the matter remains that uh, uh this is uh, there is no such issue out there but more importantly kushal mm -hmm. you know we uh, tend to get caught up in this thing that will shabash sharif be the guy we can deal with will nawaz sharif will bilawal bhutto will asif zardari or do we have to talk to the army do we do this do we do that you know we should get out of this rut because we are constantly second guessing i don't care whether i talk to the chaprasi in the pakistan foreign office okay as long as the whoever i speak to i have to see whether that damn country is delivering on its promises its assurances mm -hmm. or is it going to start using this thing that no janab i wanted to do it but somebody else came and sabotaged it that's not my problem yaar if you are the prime minister of the damn country and you say that somebody came and sabotaged your initiative then it's on your head right you can't come to me and tell me that i'm sorry i can't control these people if you can't control it then why should i talk to you and mm. why should i talk to somebody else now the trap is now we have convinced ourselves let us talk to the army bhai the american spoke to the army for 20 years look how the pakistan army shafted the americans you think mm. they will not do it to us Hmm. what christine fair very often says they'll speak pleasant lies to us our people will say oh wow pakistan army is on board then they'll stab you in the back you know so i think we need to we need really need to start getting real about that damn country yaar and we have to understand where they are coming from what their approach towards india is what their attitude towards the hindu community is uh, you have to understand it all if you are not getting it then maybe you should not be in the job you are in and i don't mean you personally i mean people who are taking these decisions hmm. how much after 75 years if you have not realized this when will you that is true i think uh, you know you you've hit the nail on the head i don't know what it is i think stockholm syndrome me have when it comes to this okay now now let us pivot into pakistan is the anchor but maybe i want to pivot into three peripheral areas so one is the pakistani relationship uh and our relationship with china so it's like a you know two front war or whatever we want to call it first so uh, from what i have understood like shahbaz sharif uh, was very active in that uh, china pakistan economic corridor he was one of the people who used to you know push it a lot shahbaz sharif so now that he's come in so do you think his thing uh, with the chinese will change or make it make things worse for us or better for us or it doesn't matter it's always the same anyways yeah what is the cpec bhai aisa hai na this jo cpec hai at one level um the chinese uh, have invested money in a particular in some projects that money is going waste because mm -hmm. cpec hasn't taken off it will never mm -hmm. take off okay they put up uh, they've invested something like 20 billion dollars over the last 8 uh, or 9 years 8 years or so 20 billion dollars over 8 years and it's not even an investment technically because that investment does not show in the pakistani books what the chinese have done is that they have said that we are investing this money but all the transactions have happened inside china but uh, investment kya hui wo yaar la ke plant bana diya na agar road bhi banate hain to wo sara kuch china se leke aate hain theek hai to wo 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 sab kar diya unhone 
और बिल आपको पकड़ा दिया इट्स लाइक like कि मैं यार सब कुछ तेरे घर में बना रहा हूं मतलब कि आई एम नॉट इन्वेस्टिंग मनी बट आई एम मेकिंग समथिंग एंड अब ये बिल पकड़ ले अब इसकी पेमेंट करनी शुरू कर दो ब्रॉडली यू नो टू डम इट डाउन इट्स लाइक दैट अच्छा नाउ व्हाट इज हैपनिंग इज दैट द पाकिस्तानीज आर अनएबल टू मेक द पेमेंट दे आर डिफॉल्टिंग ऑन देयर पेमेंट कमिटमेंट्स टू द चाइनीज सो इवन जस्ट ऑन द पावर प्लांट्स नॉट ऑल द पावर प्लांट्स हैव कम ऑन ऑनलाइन but even on the power plants which have come online which are supplying power they owe some of those companies something to the tune of 350 billion rupees uh, uh, that is about uh, 35000 crores theek hai that is what they owe these companies uh, ye denge kahan se pakistani तो वही है ना तो अब वो बोल रहे हैं कि इनके तो ये पेमेंट रिलीज करो तो वो बीच बीच में 50 बिलियन का एक वो ट्रांस दे देते हैं फिर बोलते हैं जनाब थोड़ा रुको थोड़ा मदद करो थोड़े हमारे को लोन दे दो उन्हीं का लोन लेकर उनको वापस कर देते होल कंट्री इज लिविंग ऑन डेट इट्स लिटरली लिविंग ऑन डेट इट्स इट्स रनिंग ऑन एम इट्स लिविंग ऑन डेट इट्स लाइक आई कमिंग टू यू एन सेन दैट लुक आई हैव यू टू हंड्रेड रुपीज कैन यू प्लीज लेट मी टू वो 250 में से I give you back your 250 I'll keep for the next time and I'll blow it up next time I'll come to you I'll ask you for more money so that's what they've been doing with the Chinese the Chinese have understood it plus the Ch the Pakistanis have now started balking because some of the terms and conditions on which some of these other projects are likely to come up the Pakistanis are going to go bust it is it is uh, like uh, Sri Lanka uh, only uh, Uh, a couple of times uh, you know you multiply it a couple of times so they are now balking ke yaar where the hell are we going to how the hell are we going to service this thing the chinese understand that they are going to start losing their money so they are leaning on the pakistanis to return their money but they also keep lending them money it's like what the imf and others do ke if this guy goes under then the money is completely lost so you might as well keep you know giving him something and keep taking back something but how long that's not a sustainable proposition beyond a point of time so uh, now shabash sharif has come and he says that look i am now going to go ahead with these cpec projects good luck to him where is the money going to come from how are you going to service it the whole assumption of cpec was that the chinese would come and install a lot of you know industry in pakistan that hasn't happened and that is not likely to happen okay so there are clear problems in that at the same time does this mean that the relationship is going for a six no i think the strategic dimension of that relationship uh, remains pretty much intact pakistan remains in the chinese corner uh, pakistan remains uh, economically and militarily dependent on and diplomatically dependent on china uh so i don't think uh, there is any break uh, coming on that uh, particular uh, relationship anytime soon that's not happening okay now let's pivot into afghanistan now taliban has completely taken over afghanistan obviously when you and i had spoken around 10 months ago uh, the process was on and we were discussing kya hone wala hai kya nahi hone wala hai obviously now you know we've gone the whole uh, hog as they say afghanistan is completely basically a taliban controlled area and how much uh, do you think this creates an issue for our relations with, with afghanistan as you know pakistan is known to court the taliban all the time so how do, how do you think is going to play out for us now with this new government and and taliban to hai hi jo hai kushal it's going to be a complex uh, situation mm-hmm. i think uh, what we have seen is or what we are trying to see is is there any space for us uh, to be in kabul and i think this this official delegation which had gone was probably also you know looking around feeling around whether there is something like that does that mean we are going to restore diplomatic relations i don't think so Uh, i don't think anybody else is also doing it uh 
third i think we have to look at um, how are the taliban going to be on uh, issues of serious concern to us on terrorism will they be pandering to the terrorist groups as of now uh, there is uh, every indication that they are uh, continuing to uh, you know pander to those terrorist groups mm-hmm. so that's that's a deal breaker as far as we are concerned uh, mm-hmm. okay we've sent some 50000 tons of wheat uh but that gives us a bit of an opening uh, in more ways than one but whether we will take this forward i think it's an open question right fair enough uh we are also seeing whether uh, you know uh, and and there are some telltale signs on that that uh not only is the taliban movement uh, uh has divisions within it again just because they have divisions and they have factions does not mean that they are going to go after each other you know i think people very often conflate these things and we should be careful not to do that so like there'll be factions within bjp and there'll be factions within congress and there'll be factions within other parties that does not mean that the party sees to you know is going to be suffering a civil war or is going to split up it might happen but it might not but we see some of those uh fissures within the taliban movement uh so can we use those number one number two we also see a, a certain amount of uh, tension uh between uh the taliban in general and factions in particular and pakistan uh so it's not as though pakistan has the run of the place and it's not as though pakistan exercises all the influence it exercises a lot of influence even now uh but uh but i think there are now certain limitations on that one when pakistan uh, was uh, helping the taliban in the 90s there was no tehreek-e taliban pakistan now there is so that's one big change which has come al qaeda was a fledgling organization at that time al qaeda is very much present there was no isis at that time isis is very much a presence now uh that is one part of it second part of it is that uh, uh way back in the 90s the pakistan economy was again sputtering but it wasn't uh, in the icu like it is now and back then there were times when the pakistanis would actually uh, give a lot of money and assistance to taliban now the situation is pakistan is importing wheat pakistan is importing sugar pakistan is importing virtually everything and has no money so whatever support they could give is not going to be there okay third uh go back to 90 mid 90s late 90s there were tensions in pakistan america relations all of that but pakistan was still not in an international uh, kind of a dog house or seen as an international basket case the way it is seen now it was still able to pull diplomatic punches it's not able to do it to the same level now in the 90s it was able to influence the policy of some of the gulf states towards the taliban it can't do that now so a lot has changed does that create space for us i don't know I, you know it maybe it does maybe it doesn't but uh, but i think uh, 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 we are being pragmatic about it uh i might not agree with that policy but that's different you know uh but from as a purely as an analyst uh what i see is a certain degree of pragmatism uh in government towards afghanistan towards the taliban uh a certain amount of realism uh, that look maybe we need to engage with these guys we need to see how this thing is going to play itself out uh so i think that's the positive side of it there will be political repercussions uh you know there will be ideological issues involved 
uh, how does a government like this uh, do business with a regime like Taliban? Mm. So there will be some of those issues which will come up. Uh, there is the diehard crowd which will continue to support no matter what. But there will be other people uh, who will ask uh, or who will look askance at the policy uh, these guys make. But again, not an insurmountable obstacle. So we'll have to see how this thing unfolds. We'll have to see what is the Pakistani game plan, how that plays out. We'll have to see how the intra-Taliban dynamic plays out. We will have to see how the Taliban versus other groups dynamic plays out. But what the Taliban have also done, uh, which is something which is uh, we should be looking at very carefully. The Taliban policy towards Pakistan, by and large, Hmm. is similar to the Pakistani policy uh, on taking the Americans up the garden path. Hmm. All that the Pakistanis did with the Americans is now being done by the Taliban vis-a-vis the TTP with Pakistan. Hmm. We will talk about you. ठीक है ना लेकिन हम इनके ऊपर हाथ नहीं डाल सकते हाथ डालेंगे तो ये हाथ से बाहर निकल जाएंगे ये आईसिस ज्वाइन कर लेंगे यही चीजें पाकिस्तानी अमेरिकियों को बोलते थे हम आपको फैसिलिटेट कर देंगे आप इनको कुछ दे दें आप इनके साथ मात कर लें आप इनको हरा नहीं सकते इनसे रजामंदी कर लें रजामंदी फॉर द पाकिस्तानी इज विल मीन सरेंडरिंग सोवरेनिटी टू द टीटीपी आर दे गोइंग टू बी रेडी टू डू दैट so this virus is not going away anytime anywhere soon okay uh, one last question and then i'll start taking the audience questions so what do you make of this in this entire scenario um do you think this current government will be able to either improve relations with the americans or the middle east because middle east and pakistan you know in the last few years with india's improvement in relations with the middle east and countries uh has been there but can pakistan maybe see an opportunity in the sense that ye jo russia ka pura russia ukraine ka ho raha hai and with india taking it a very taking a very firm stance on on importing russian oil in fact from what i understand india is looking to cut a even bigger deal with russia as of now uh, uh in purchasing oil uh i uh, <clears throat> let me let me absolutely be sure about it because i th- think i did read uh, uh, a clip of that in bloomberg yeah so bloomberg mein i i'm quoting the headline india in talks to increase russia oil imports from rosneft state refiners want more crude directly from russia oil company imports from russia to displace spot purchases from elsewhere now considering that do you think maybe the americans will again go and say okay pakistan how are you kind of a thing and how does it affect us this is my last yeah dekho um, th- look Americans are dealing with us not because they love us. Hmm. Okay? They are dealing with us because um, somewhere along the line our interests are converging. Now we will have to make sure and that will be our test of diplomacy uh, how we keep that convergence in play. And that convergence is primarily with uh, on, on the China axis. Russia is a bit of a side show uh, as far as the Americans are concerned or should be. Uh, how will the Amer- americans put china and russia uh, you know in the context of india that india is ready to do business with the americans as far as china is concerned but on russia we are not willing to go whole hog partly because look yaar uh, we are a country of 1.3 billion people we have to take care of our people if we are getting oil uh, at a 40 dollar discount from the russians why should we not take it here absolutely right uh, what happened in ukraine is not my war so but look this is good for polemics but that's not how international diplomacy works uh, because they will uh, lean upon you they will pressure you they will want some concession somewhere something so we'll have to see how that works out pakistan doesn't fit into it now uh, of course the americans can say that okay fine to sock it to us they will start dealing with the pakistanis okay what are they going to get out of the pakistanis here like they can try it they've tried it in the past 
if they haven't been satisfied with all the shafting they have received in the last 20 years, they are free to go ahead and do it again. Okay. Uh, so that is one part of it. Uh, the Arab world, uh, look, I think it is to the credit of the Modi government that it reached out to the Arab world and 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 our relations with the Middle East have really improved. But I think we also need to be careful how we are handling things at home. You know, it's all very well to do all the chest thumping that we see on social media and other things. Uh, but uh, I think things need to be handled with a fair degree of diplomacy, uh, you know, on, on these issues. You can't jeopardize uh, the interests of 1.3 billion people, uh, you know, on a matter of a principle, which is a very hoary principle in India because nobody really, it, it becomes a principle when, you know, uh, things uh, start going or I, but uh, it's never a principle otherwise. Mm -hmm. Either it's a principle, then it should be a principle for everybody. Mm -hmm. So let's, you know, so I am a little skeptical on that. But, yeah, but this is a completely different topic. So I don't want to wait. I into get it. it. Yeah. And let's not even get into it. That's not our subject of the day. That's also. not our subject, right? But, but there, yeah. there's a, things to be said on all sides. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be careful on that. But I will the uh, Arab world say, okay, fine. Now we are going to break off with India and go with Pakistan. They will keep giving something to Pakistan. But it will not be enough to pull them out of the rut they are in because you have to look at their economy and the numbers to understand the rut they are in. Let me just give you a very quick example. Sure. Uh, in the year which is now going to end on the 30th of June, the, uh, the numbers have still to come out but the grapevine is that the revenue of the federal government and I'm not talking about total revenue and you know, the revenue which the federal government gets. Uh, it is only going to be enough to pay debt servicing. 90% of the defense expenditure also is going to be on borrowed funds. And every other expenditure, every other expenditure is going to be borrowed funds. And chances are that next time, even that 90% uh, 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 borrowed funds, 100% borrowed funds, yoga defense. So they are in a terrible, terrible, terrible bind economically. Even if they get some space, you know, somebody pumps in some money, they get some space, they tied over the next two years, three years. This crisis is going to come back even more viciously after three years. Because this is a basically a structural crisis. And that structural crisis was of a nature that until and unless they are going to do a deep surgery of the economic structure, it's not going to sort itself out. It is not any longer a stabilization and adjustment which is required. Stabilization and adjustment will only buy you a couple of years. But what you need is massive structural change in the economy. And that, my friend, even stabilization and adjustment is extremely painful. But a structural change is, is uh, you know, revolution inviting. Not that Pakistanis will ever revolt. Punjab, Punjab mein culture nahi hai revolt karne ka, but, uh, but yeah, it will cause a lot of problems. Enormous. Mm. You know, on a lighter note, I think Pakistan should take the consultancy services of Vandana Shivaji, like she gave wonderful consultancy to Sri Lanka on organic farming. I think it would be yeah, awesome. No, no, no. I think that's unfair. Uh, see, the Lankans did went in for organic farming for two reasons. One was, but it, it's all being dumbed onto this. One I know. Was I was just the, being facetious. No, no. But I think it is important to clarify. They. Uh, they did it partly because they thought uh, organic farming will get them better prices, number one. Number two, they did it because they could not afford chemical fertilizers anymore because of the foreign exchange crunch. So they said, we don't have the money to get this chemical fertilizer. Let's go in for organic. And the price which we get, so we'll save money on one side. And number two, the price which we get with organic farming 
uh, will more than make up for whatever shortfall there might be. Unfortunately, those assumptions proved completely false. But yeah, stay away from these NGO types. Yeah. Chalo. <laughs> Abhi, abhi questions lete hai, Sushant. Uh, we'll take the viewers' questions. Fadavat, fadavat, uh, answer karte and then we'll wrap it up. All right. I'm going to go from the first question and then I'll take to, to go to the. Um, okay, somebody has asked Imran Khan constantly rants about America conducting a regime change in Pak. Will this affect Indo? Uh, sorry, sorry, Pakistan US relations? That's a good question. Young Ladka Mujamalame just named a question. Pucha. They, look, it. It all, the reason why he has come up with this conspiracy theory is that the relations between uh, the US and Pakistan were already impacted because of Imran Khan's demagoguery. Uh, for example, Joe Biden, ever since he became president, uh, didn't even bother to talk to Imran Khan. Right? Mm. He treated him like a pariah, uh, which continues to rankle in Imran. Uh, and uh, Apparently, the Americans had delivered a message to the Pakistanis that, look, if this guy continues and with the kind of posturing he is doing, uh, we can't deal with him. So, you know, forget about it. Uh, if this guy is going to carry on, then, you know, our relations are going to suffer. Now, this is normal diplomatic conversations which happen all the time. Mm -hmm. But having latched on to that and come up with this conspiracy theory... Uh, I think essentially Imran Khan might have floated the narrative, but he shot himself in the foot. Because mm -hmm. now it's very clear that the Americans, uh, at least as long as the Biden administration is there, which is there for at least the next two years, uh, two and a half years, uh, they are not going to do business with Imran Khan. And uh, you can like the Americans or hate them, but uh, you have to admit that they remain the most powerful country in the world militarily, mm -hmm. economically and diplomatically. So mm -hmm. uh, as they say, ke jungle mein sher se karke to aap nahi bach sakte na. to fir, uh, there is that factor. But uh, yeah, if Imran Khan was to come back, it would certainly uh, impact on the relation. But as of now, I think the Americans have indicated, uh, the Pakistanis are sucking up to them and the Americans have indicated that they are not averse to uh, uh, to you know putting the relationship back on the rails so as of now that is where it stands does this mean that they will get a lot of money from the americans they'll cut a lot of slack for the pakistanis i don't think so mm -hmm. uh, but uh, does it mean that the americans are going to uh, you know be bloody minded about it and go uh, to to fix the pakistanis i also don't think that will happen mm -hmm. so a a question kisne pucha hai uh, can you please request Sushant sir to recommend some books to read on Pakistan and Afghanistan and will Sindh and Balochistan ever break up? <laughs> How can India help? India can help by becoming stronger. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I strongly believe that that's the best thing we can do. Uh, just put a greater gap between us and these guys and uh, one day it will fall off by itself. We don't have to do anything. If they try and match up, they'll fall off. If they don't match up, they will have to count out to us. So it, it's, I think that is the secret of success. Uh, as for books, I look, I don't know how much you've read about. I think my suggestion to you would be, uh, if you want to understand Pakistan, read Hussein Haqqani's books on Pakistan. By far the best uh, author on Pakistan. Uh, there is a good book on the Pakistan army by this fellow Shuja Nawaz. He's written two books again. You can read uh, Shuja Nawaz. He's very good on Pakistan. Uh, then um, Aisha Siddiqui's book on the Pakistan army is not bad, but it's a kind of tedious reading. Uh, so I won't, uh, you know, it, it, it depends on how academically inclined you are. I'm, I'm, I have so many books. I don't know where to start and where to end, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Kya okay. Kya, kya so, so I will okay. recommend this. Christine the Fair is also very good. Yeah. So in the description of the podcast, at least I have a link to all of Sushant's essays that he has written in the ORF. So for starters, come se come ja ke unko padlo. That is my answer. So, okay. Mm, let me see. Mm. 
Okay, this is very interesting. So, why do you think Imran Khan was uh, attacking RSS and BJP constantly internationally? Like, uh, especially RSS. I, I remember uh, Imran Khan's tweets all the time were attacking RSS. So, why, why, what is the strategy behind it? As like, um, it, was it to show that there is a global Muslim community or something like that? He's like, he's trying to show that he's a leader of the Ummah or something? I think it was bo- it was partly uh, domestic politics, uh, taking a shot at uh, these guys. Uh, partly, I think it was a kind of a PR campaign because apparently somebody has uh, disclosed that, uh, you know, he's consulting a PR agency, which has asked him to latch on to religion. Uh, now, this, the moment you start talking about fascism, you talk about Nazism, Hitler, you know, this is basically यार एक वो ऑक्सफोर्ड से पढ़ा है तो उसकी जो बेसिक नॉलेज है वो 1970 में वो भी थर्ड क्लास में पास हुआ था वो तो और वो भी शायद ग्रेस मार्क से पास हुआ था तो वो जो है यू नो उस जमाने का वो जो पढ़ाई वढ़ाई उसने की हुई है उसको थोड़ी बहुत नॉलेज है जो भी थोड़ी बहुत है बट आई थिंक ही अंडरस्टूड दैट इफ आई यूज दिस वर्ड्स इट विल गेट ट्रैक्शन इन यूरोप एंड अमेरिका in the west right so keep badgering on and imran khan style is that just keep badgering take a lie and the, it's it's a very gobels kind of a logic you know just take a lie keep hammering it and it will start gaining currency unfortunately for him everybody in the, including in the west told him you don't do this this is not how leaders behave you know you, you're not a he is a tucha but you know they thought he is not so they would tell him that listen don't do this this kind of language is not you know uh, does not fit into the diplomatic uh, community but he went on and on so i think it was partly uh, he was trying to burnish his credentials within partly he was trying to create a a, a, a kind of a narrative in the west uh, and then of course he was targeting you know uh, the the uh, the bjp the rss and all of them and it in his very simple minded uh, you know dumb down brain uh, this narrative also kind of fit in pretty well so i'm not surprised that he was latched on to it it didn't pay him any dividends but not only him that other idiot who was his national security advisor uh, a very third rate fellow by the name of muid uh, yusuf he also matlab ye five why talk about Oxford and Cambridge. Let's talk about. He's a Boston University graduate. He's also of the same. But you see, I think that the culture from which they come has Hindu hatred so deeply embedded in it that they will come on. You know, they will come and meet you and pretend that they are good friends, but they are not because it's very deep seated in their psyche. But you don't want to recognize it because you know you want to be politically correct. Good luck to you, but. that's the that's the sad and ugly fact fair enough okay do you think ghq will ever move away from their ideology of bleeding india with the thousand cuts i think your answer is a clear cut no so i don't need to i can answer that for you look I, you see i can think whatever i want to think but i think ultimately uh, you have to see what is happening on the ground mm mm-hmm. and if there is absolutely no telltale sign that on ground anything has changed then you know you still want to ignore that and you want to imagine that ghq will change kushal in my view the time to change was uh, maybe uh, about 12 years 13 years back around 2004 5 when you know this whole uh, uh terrorism thing started inside pakistan okay uh around 2003 4 actually that was the time when many of their army chiefs also made statements that the primary threat now is internal that was the time they could have changed their orientation there was money coming in from the west there were trade opportunities and connectivity opportunities opening up they could have kashmir was winding down they could have used that opportunity to normalize and there was also a peace process of sorts going on 
what they did was that they uh, gave you all the pocket bull story of wanting to you know improve relations but mm. uh, they continued to bleed you uh, there were 17 17 major terror attacks in the period from 2004 to uh, the mumbai attacks this includes a train blast in mumbai this includes the german bakery blast in uh, pune this includes the zaveri bag uh, zaveri bazaar blast in mumbai these include the entire indian mujahideen attacks which had a pakistani uh, fingerprint now if despite that evidence you think that the pakistani orientation has changed good luck to you then you are a sitting duck go ahead hmm yeah fair enough this is this is such a interesting question considering i mean i'm i'm adding the caveat here considering the shambles that the pakistani army in a, a pakistani economy is in can can america force pakistan to give up their nuclear weapons in exchange of money to save their economy <laughs> no that is a fear a lot of pakistanis are expressing but i think um, there isn't sufficient recognition in pakistan what default means it is one thing to look at sri lanka and say no no default is a very bad thing it's quite another to go through it mm. because when default happens and when your economy starts melting down then there are huge 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 problems i think what the pakistanis are banking on is that because they have nukes they will not be allowed to default hmm. they will be rescued so so pakistan ka idea nahi hai humko paise de do nahi to kisi ko bomb maar denge ye pakistan nahi, ka nahi nahi dekho bhai we are too dangerous to fail hum fail ho gaye yeah. tum dekh lo fir duniya barbad ho jayegi so that's that, that's how they've been doing business but what has happened so far is that uh, that assumption hasn't really come true so far they mm-hmm. went to the imf recently the imf asked them to buzz off until and unless they were going to do uh, take some of the prior actions which the imf has told them to take so they had to come back and raise fuel prices and electricity tariffs and right now there is another round of tariff increases likely to come uh, basically the world is telling them that you have to pay your own bills nobody is going to foot your bills for you and the pakistanis are not used to footing their own bills <laughs> Yeah, so, that's uh, true. Yeah, their culture is that take a loan and treat it as income. So, if your culture is that that a loan is disposable income, then uh, you know you're going to be in the shit house sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. I I agree. So, so will the new regime? And someone has asked, will the new regime change uh, Pakistan's relations with Bangladesh and countries like Malaysia, Turkey? or or it's going to be remaining the same and it may not really have that much of an effect i don't think it'll have much of an impact they'll have good relations no i don't know how much with bangladesh but certainly with turkey or turkey yaar yeah, what does turkey bring to the table yaar yeah? they've got 75% inflation in turkey mari it's an economy which is going down the tube malaysia mm. is neither here nor there mari how does it count and uh, imran khan tried to do it with malaysia and turkey and then the saudis cracked the whip and you know they had to go scurrying back so i think there are some limitations on how much they can go with turkey malaysia and these other countries uh, acha what is the current relationship of pakistan then with iran like uh, iran has spoken out consistently against india in the recent past so uh, is iran now like going close to that whole sino pak uh, yeah so nexus? iran uh, it, i think what they're trying to do is um keep the relationship with iran going but their problem is that if they start getting too close to iran it'll rile the saudis and they can't afford to antagonize the saudis see the saudis uh, you know it's it's the same between us and iran and saudi arabia okay hmm. the thing is that uh, we have more people working in saudi arabia than we have in iran not even a fraction of it work in iran uh we have a bigger market in saudi arabia than we have in iran 
uh, we have more to gain from Saudi Arabia than we have to do with Iran. It is all of that plus more in the case of Pakistan because they get a lot of money, free money from uh, Saudi Arabia. Iran gives them nothing. What can Iran mm -hmm. give them? They, they had a pipeline project with Iran, even which they could not complete because of the sanctions on Iran. So there mm -hmm. are, I think, limitations to how much they can go with Iran. Yes, to the extent that the Iranians back them on Kashmir, uh, is, uh, is something which works well for us because that gives us a clear conscience to go and do business in the Saudis. Mm. Right? Iranians are no cousins of ours. Yeah. If they are not going to, if they are going to hit at our vital interest, then I see no reason why I have to suck up to the Iranians. Mm. Right? So, uh, so I think uh, it's again, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a uh, multiple uh, axes along which you have to work. But basically, between Pakistan and Iran, they'll go up to a point, but no further because of the Saudi factor. Fair and enough. And the sanctions on Iran. Yeah. This, this question is hilarious because uh, it comes from a place of curiosity. Somebody has literally said, how the hell do the Pakistanis manage to lobby so well, Just not just in Middle Eastern countries, I would add every other country, in spite of having such a ghatiya economy. I mean, all the money is put there. No, yeah, they go lobbying. It's not so much about lobbying. Look, you know, in relations between countries, uh, it takes a long time before you start changing things. Uh, what we have started doing in the last eight, nine years, uh, Modi was the first prime minister who went to UAE in 35 years or something. Hmm. How crazy is that? Such a vital uh, and important place. And we've never gone there. So, I think uh, he's the first Prime Minister to travel to Israel, which is such an important partner of ours. But what happens is that uh, when you're trying to break into another country, it takes a long time before relationships change. Look, uh, even with the US, you know, our relationship with the US has improved tremendously over the last 20-25 years. Actually, post Cargill, really. Hmm. But it's improved and it took about 10-15 years to bring it to a point where it could start taking off. So it's taken close to uh, about uh, 35 to 40 years to reach the level which we have reached now. So uh, to imagine that uh, overnight Pakistan's relations with the Gulf will go down the tube and India will you know, become the, the, the primary player uh, as far as South Asia is concerned, it's not going to happen. And yet, if you see the kind of changes which have taken place over the last few years in terms of trade, in terms of investment, in terms of security cooperation, in terms of cultural cooperation, mm. I think it's remarkable. It's, it's, it's remarkable what has happened. And I think it is important for us to uh, make sure that this momentum does not break. But Fair will enough. we be wise enough to do that? Well, yeah, that 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 only the future will tell. Uh, okay, we've we've uh, asked all the questions, Sushant. Just before we wrap it up, uh, any last words before we we close today's session? No, yeah, I say last words. I say it sounds very much like a death sentence. Any last words? all right guys we'll wrap today's discussion up uh, so before we wrap it up sushant buddy it's always uh, a pleasure talking to you so thanks a lot first of all for coming thanks man thanks for having me okay guys so we'll wrap today's discussion up but before we do that i will urge all of you when you go into the description of the podcast whether you're listening to the audio version or you're watching this video uh, you'll find sushant's twitter handle and the link to all the articles or essays that Sushant has written on the Observer Research Foundation website, please follow him on Twitter. Go and read his work. And uh, always try to tell Sushant how Anand Ranganathan is the real Punjabi. <laughs> and Sushant, and Sushant is not. As far as I'm concerned, please support the Charvak podcast. You can subscribe to the channel, like the video. You know, Please support me either on YouTube or Patreon or the merch or UPI. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, namaste, take care. Bye-bye.